Well, welcome back. The title of this lesson is called Arc Sine, Arc Cosine, Arc Tangent. This is part one. In other words, the title of this lesson is Inverse Sine, Inverse Cosine, Inverse Tangent. So we have kind of a, uh, a, a cousin to each of the trig functions, and that would be the inverse, the inverse of the sine, the inverse of the cosine, the inverse of the tangent. Now, I'm really excited to teach this lesson because arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent gets very, very confusing with almost every book I've ever seen. It's really not the fault of the book, it's just that it's actually really hard to draw on paper what, you know, what's going on here and get it across without actually talking to somebody. So what I'm going to do, I think, in the beginning is I have drawn some things myself and I want to show you the punchline of what's actually happening without any real explanation. Then I'm going to walk you through a detailed, uh, I don't want to call it a derivation, but a detailed sequence of, of, of problems that shows you exactly why the arc cosine, the arc sine, the arc tangent behave the way that they do, because it is not obvious the first time you look at it. But I can tell you, for those of you who think, oh, I'll just blow through this, no problem, it's just the opposite of the cosine or opposite of the sine, I really encourage you to watch the entire lesson and practice the problems, because there are several gotchas in here that will come back to haunt you in the future. I can say that you will use this stuff all throughout algebra, all throughout uh, trig and pre-calculus, all throughout calculus, and definitely all throughout physics and engineering. So take a moment here and listen to what we're talking about so you understand exactly how these things behave. Okay, up until now, we have been taking the sine, the cosine, the tangent, whatever, of an angle. So for instance, sine of 30 is 1 half, which is the same thing as sine of pi over 6 radians is 1 half, because pi over 6 radians is 30 degrees, okay? So in your mind, think, sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, sine of 30 is 1 half. That's the direction we've been going. So there is an opposite operation to all of these functions called the inverse. Remember, the inverse of a function just does the opposite. It kind of undoes the original function, right? So basically, the arc sine does the opposite operation of the sine. So for instance, if you know, and I'm going to write all this on the board, so don't stress out here in the beginning, but verbally, just follow me here. If you know that the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, then you know that the arc sine of 1 half is giving you back an angle of pi over 6. Let me say that one more time. When you do the arc sine operation of a number, you're asking for the angle back. So instead of taking the sine of an angle to get a number, we're going to take the arc sine of some number and get the angle back. So it's the way that we find the angles, how we reverse solve for the angles in a triangle or in an equation or whatever, is going to be basically the arc sine, the arc cosine, the arc tangent. It goes the opposite direction. So we're going to be taking the arc cosine, the arc tangent, the arc sine of some number and getting an angle back from it. However, there's a huge gotcha here and that is the way the unit circle works. There's always multiple angles around the unit circle that can give you the same sign. So there's always going to be multiple choices. And so we have uh, in your books, you'll see exactly how we lock it down and, and to know what angles the calculator, or the computer is going to give back to you. So we have to talk through that. So again, let me give you the punchline, then we're going to go through a quite a detailed uh, set of problems so that you understand exactly where it's coming from. Here is the punchline for those of you who want to know the punchline. I am not going to go through all of this right now because I'm going to go through it in detail in the lesson. But we have this function called the inverse sine, also called the arc sine. It is the opposite operation of a sine. You feed numbers into the arc sine operation and you get angles back. The numbers that you feed into the arc sine can only be from plus one to minus one. I'll explain why later. You put those numbers into the arc sine, you press the button on your calculator, out comes an angle. But the calculator will only give you angles from negative pi over two to pi over two, these angles over here. If you hit any inverse sine of anything on the calculator, when it gives you an answer back, it will never be outside of this range, negative 90 to 90 degrees, or negative pi over two to pi over two radians. I will explain exactly why as we go through the lecture here. Then we have an inverse cosine operation, also called arc cosine. Because the cosine can only be between negative 1 and 1, I'll explain why in a minute, then the input to the arc cosine function can only be between negative 1 and positive 1. And because of that, the angles that the calculator will give back as the baseline angles can only fall between 0 and pi. You see, negative 1 and 1 fall on the x-axis here, so the angles that you will get back will only be up here in the top half of the unit circle. 0 to pi, or 0 to 180. That's what this means. But greater than 0, less than pi. Greater than 0, less than 180. If you stick a number in your calculator and hit arc cosine, inverse cosine, you will never get an angle outside of that range. Okay? 
Arctangent is the one that's really bizarre and weird and hard to understand at first. There's an inverse tangent called arctangent operation. The inputs to the arctangent can be way outside of the range of negative one to positive one. They can be negative infinity up to positive infinity. I will explain as we go through the lesson why that's the case. The numbers that you can feed into this operator, this is like a function essentially here, that you can put into there can be any number at all from negative infinity to positive infinity. But the angles that you get out of the arctangent operation will only be between negative pi over two and pi over two, negative pi over two to pi over two or negative 90 to positive 90. So this is the punchline. I don't expect you to understand anything other than the fact that when you do an arc sine operation or you do an arc cosine operation or you do an arc tangent operation, what you're getting out as an answer is an angle. And the angle that you get back out of each one of those operations has limits to it. Your calculator or computer will never give you an angle outside of those limits. For an arc sine, you will always get an angle between negative pi over two or pi over two back, which is negative 90 to positive 90. For an arc cosine, you will always get an angle between zero and pi, which means zero and 180. For an arc tangent, you will always get an angle between negative pi over two to pi over two, which is negative 90 to positive 90 degrees. That's the punchline. Now the question is, why is that? We have to dive into it. I don't want you to just memorize things. I want you to understand things. So let's cover this up. We will revisit this in great detail, I promise you. And let's go down and talk ex exactly through the logic of why all this works. It is more than a one or a two minute thing. I can't compress it into three minutes. So please watch the whole thing and you will understand exactly the reasons why. All right, so we know, we know for instance, that the sine of pi over six, which is 30 degrees, right? Remember pi over six is 30 degrees, is what? You should all remember sine of 30 is the famous one half. I've been telling you sine of 30 is one half, sine of 30 is one half. Now that we know radian, sine of pi over six is one half. So how do we go backwards? If we know the sine of pi over six is one half, then we should be able to say the following thing. Arc sine, which is inverse sine, or the opposite operation of the sine, of whatever the kind of the answer is, one half, let, let me do it this way. Let me do it this way. Arc sine of, um, yeah, let me do it this way. Arc sine of one half is going to equal what angle? Like this is what this is basically asking you to do. Arc sine of one half is what angle? Another way to write this, you can kind of translate this problem. I mean, we've written it down here, but it's the same thing as saying the sine of some angle is equal to one half. When you say arc sine of one half, what you're really asking is sine of what unknown angle is equal to one half. And you know in your mind that sine of 30 is one half. So it makes sense, right? Sine of 30 is one half, 30 degrees. So we can then say that this angle is 30 degrees, uh, but we don't like to talk about degrees too much now. So we say it's actually pi over six radians, right? So one way to write it is called arc sine. That's the cleanest way to write it. That means inverse of the sine operation, going backwards. Give me the number, I give you the angle. That's what it is, All right? But you can also write this in the following way. You can write it in a different way, and sometimes you'll see it written like this in different books. You might see it written as the following. Sine with a little negative one up here of one half is equal to pi over six. This representation is exactly the same as this representation. So when you see sine to the negative one power, it does not mean that it's raised to the negative one power. It doesn't, okay? It does not mean one over sine, okay? It doesn't mean that. The negative one is not an exponent. The negative one is if you remember back, we talked about inverse functions a long time ago. We said that negative one up there can mean inverse function. So this literally means inverse function of the sine function. So this is the inverse sine of some number gives me some angle. Again, going backwards. This is very confusing to write down because the negative one looks like an exponent, so it confuses a lot of people. So it's much more clean to say arc sine, but you can write it either way and you'll see it either way in lots of books. You'll see in calculus or whatever, you'll see it written both ways, depending on the author, okay? So it returns an angle back. Let's give another quick example. And then I'm gonna show you the huge gotcha in here about why it's so confusing in just a second. So let's go and take a look at another one that we know very, very easily or very, very rapidly. What is the arc cosine of square root of three over two? So we wanna figure out, we have the inverse of the cosine function. That means we wanna take as an input, not an angle. We wanna take 
kind of what the unit circle gives you around the outside in red. The number coming off the unit circle, and I want to get the angle back. That's what the arc cosine, the arc sine does for us. So what you can do in order to kind of translate this in your mind is you can then say that this is the same thing as saying that the cosine of some unknown angle is the square root of three over two. And the unknown angle is what you're kind of getting here. So the cosine of what angle here is gonna do that? The cosine of pi over six degrees is the square root of three over two, which means that kind of coming up and translating up here, the co arc cosine of square root of three over two is the angle pi over six or 30 degrees. How do we know that? Because we know the sine of 30 degrees is one half. The cosine of 30 degrees is the other number, square root of three over two. So the cosine of 30 degrees squared to three over two, which means the arc cosine of the answer is the angle coming back, okay? And of course, another way to write this that you might see in other books down the road, another way to write this is the cosine inverse. This means inverse cosine. It does not mean one over cosine or cosine to the negative one power of the number square root of three over two is the angle coming back pi over six. Okay, pi over six. So that's another example. Let's do another uh, quick example here that we can talk about. What about arc tangent of square root of three? Arc tangent of square root of three is equal to what? Another way to do this is to translate it in your mind. When you see arc tangent of a number, the way you do it in your mind or on your paper actually, is you say the tangent of some unknown angle that I don't know is going to be equal to the square root of three, okay? Now the angle that actually works here is pi over, whoops, pi over three. So the answer to the arctangent of this going backwards is the angle pi over three, right? How do I know it's pi over three? Well, I, I know the answer, but the reason is because the tangent is the same as the sine. So put sine of pi over three over uh, cosine of pi over three. What is the sine of pi over three? That's 60 degrees, right? Sine of pi over three is 60 degrees. So you know sine of 60 degrees is the square root of three over two. And then the cosine of 60 degrees, you know is one half. If you flip and multiply, the twos will cancel and what you get back out of it is the square root of three. So you have to bust this tangent up into a sine and a cosine to figure it out unless you have it memorized. I don't actually have them memorized. So I have to go figure it out that the square root of three is the, is the result when you take the tangent of pi over three so because of that, the arc tangent of the pi over three, square root of three um, uh, number is the angle pi over three, all right? And you can also write this in another way. You can write this as or uh, tangent inverse of square root of three is pi over three, pi over three, all right? So arc tangent square root of three is the same thing as inverse tangent written with a negative one of square root of three. Do not write this or think that the negative one is an exponent. Do not try to add exponents. Do not try to subtract exponents. Don't raise the exponent to a square root and cancel them. Don't do any of that stuff because it's not a real exponent. It's just a notation that means arc tangent or arc sine or arc cosine. That's what it means. Now, the last thing I want to leave you with before we go into the details of why this is kind of so confusing is the following thing. You know, a long time ago, I introduced the concept of a function as a box. A function is a box. You stick numbers coming into this box. Inside the box is a computation. Could be any kind of function. X squared could be the function. 3X plus four could be the function. Could be a linear function. Could be a quadratic function. Could be a square root as a function. All kinds of things can be in the box. Now we're learning a new kind of function, basically, and it's called the inverse sine or the inverse cosine. So basically what you have is you feed numbers, not angles, just numbers. You feed numbers into this box, right? And what is inside of this box? This box I'm gonna represent right now is arc sine or arc cosine or arc tangent. So it's, I'm putting three different functions here as examples. But the, but the punchline is what comes out of the box? Angles come out of the box. It's actually really easy uh, to get confused, so I'm writing it down here. And of course you can get degrees if you're working in degrees or radians. So when you're taking an arc sine or an arc cosine, you need to expect degrees coming out, or you need to expect pi over six, three pi over four radians coming out. 
keep it in your mind because even though I know that you know this, it gets confusing when you start doing arc sine, arc cosine, all this stuff that you expect angles to come out. Sometimes we forget what we're doing. So numbers come in. We're gonna talk a lot about the numbers that are allowed to come into these boxes. The boxes contain arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, and the output of these boxes are basically angles. You're getting degrees or radians. All right, so we're done with the first part here. Now, the tricky part is what's coming up next, the punchline, the gotcha that I really want everybody to, um, to comprehend. Let's go back to our example. Sine of some angle is one half. We already did it. We said uh, sine of some angles one half means arc sine of one half is 30 degrees or pi over six, okay? So let's go back to sine of some angle is equal to one half. Now remember back from basic algebra, you know, you have inverse functions, inverse operations to solve equations, right? So if you have an equation like three X equals six, you're multiplying on the left-hand side by three. So to get rid of it, you do kind of the inverse operator and you divide. Opposite of multiplication is division. If you have a square root, you might undo the square root by squaring both sides. So it undoes the square root. I can go on and on. If you have a logarithm on one side, then to undo the logarithm, you might raise both sides of the equation to a power of the base of the logarithm to undo the logarithm. So here's kind of a basic equation. I know it looks so simple because we know that sine of 30 is one half, so we can solve this equation really easily. But really the real way that you solve this equation is you undo the sine uh, function and try to solve for theta and get the function or the, the variable theta by itself, and then you should have some kind of angle as a result. We already know the answer. The answer is 30 degrees or pi over six. But really the way that you sign it, or the way that you solve it, is you have to undo the sine operation. How do you undo an un a sine function? You do the inverse, the arc sine to both sides of the equation. So to solve this simple equation, what we would do is apply the arc sine to both sides of the equation. We apply it to the left, which means we're applying the arc sine to the sine uh, guy. And on the right, we have to do the same thing to both sides, just like we have to do the same thing to both sides of an equation all the time. So to solve this equation, we already know the answer, but basically we can apply the opposite function to the left and then apply the opposite function to the right. All right, now what ends up happening is the arc sine is the exact opposite of the sine, so it undoes the sine. And so all you have left on the left is theta. And on the right, you have arc sine of one half. And we already talked about the fact that arc sine of one half means that it's a 30 degree angle, so then theta is 30 degrees or pi over six, which we've already talked about. So I'm introducing arc sine, arc cosine, but I want you to understand the big picture. We obviously want to go backwards so that we can solve lots of times when we want to figure out what the angle is, but also because later we're going to have trig equations, which are really big equations with trigonometric functions. The goal of them is always going to be to figure out what theta is. So you have to have a way to rip open that box and get the theta that's inside. And the way you do it is to, is to basically annihilate the sine with its inverse, which is the arc sine. To annihilate a cosine, you use an arc cosine function. To annihilate a tangent, you use an arc tangent. And we're applying it to both sides like we solve all of these uh, equations here. So we already said the angle here is pi over 6. So let's draw this and talk about it a little bit. And I'll use the unit circle that we have on the other board as well. I think I want to do it probably right over here. Let's draw this function right here, or this unit circle right here. We'll do a little sketch, and I'll also use the real unit circle that we have over there. What we're essentially saying is that if we go to pi over 6 here, here is about, roughly speaking, a 30-degree angle. It's not perfect, but this is roughly a 30-degree angle. So I'll put theta. This is pi over 6, which is 30 degrees. What we're saying is that the sine of this angle of pi over six is one half. And that's why it is the solution of the equation. Let's go check it on the unit circle. Here's pi over six, which is 30 degrees. The cosine is the first number, the sine is the second number. So here we're saying the sine of 30 is one half, the sine of pi over six is one half, which means the projection here is right, because we're talking about the sine. The projection's on the y-axis, which is exactly in the middle, which means it's at one half, exactly the case. But let me ask you this, are there any other angles around the unit circle that also have a sign that give you one half? I mean, think about what you're asking yourself. You're over here saying uh, arc, sine of uh, some angle is one half. Give me, give me the angles that work. 
And we figured out through doing all this, arc sine, arc sine of one half, we're getting the angles, right? And we got an angle. Pi over six, we said, hey, it works. It's the angle, it's the answer. But it turns out there's tons of other answers. There's tons of other angles that work. Because in order to solve this, all you need to do is figure out the angles such that the sine of the angle is one half. Here's one of those angles. But walk with me over here and look at this. If this is pi over six, then right here would be two pi over six. Then here would be three pi over six. Then here would be four pi over six. Then here would be five pi over six. What is the sine of this angle? Five pi over six. It projects onto the y-axis at exactly the same location here. It's gonna be positive one half. So what we have figured out is that there's actually multiple answers to this. Pi over six is not the only answer, but let's just go through it. So the sine of pi over six is indeed one half. So it does satisfy this equation. However, the sine of five pi over six is actually also equal to one half. So it looks like there's another answer that lives over here. If you go back to the unit circle, the sine of this is one half, but look at this, the sine of this angle is also one half because both of these angles project onto the exact same location. But wait, there's more. There's possible to have more angles. In fact, there's an infinity number of angles that will give you that same sine of one half. What happens if I go all the way around the unit circle and continue counting until I get here? What's gonna happen there? Let's just take a look. You have pi over six, two pi over six, three, then uh, four, then five pi over six, then six, then seven, then eight, then nine, then 10, then 11, then 12. 13 pi over six is right here, 13 pi over six. So we can say that sine of 13 pi over six is also equal to one half. So this is 13 pi over six, here's 14, 15, 16, here's 17 pi over six. It gives you the same projection here. So we also know that sine of 17 pi over six is equal to one half. So you see, I can play this game again and again. Anytime I land here, anytime I land here, I'm going to get the sine of these angles. Both of them are gonna give me one half. Now, if I land on angles down here, all of these angles are gonna to project to negative one half. So the sine of those angles down there don't work. Only the angles in the upper half plane give me the sign, the same exact sign with the same <laughs> exact sign, one, the, the positive one half. Also, notice you can go in the negative direction. There's negative pi over six, negative two pi over six, negative three pi over six, negative four pi over six, negative five pi over six, negative six pi over six. Uh, negative seven pi over six is right here. Negative seven pi over six is the same location. So the sign of negative seven pi over six is also equal to one half. I encourage you, get a calculator or a computer and put all these angles in there and then hit the sign button. It's gonna give you the same thing, one half. And that's because it's a unit circle and I can keep counting over and over again. Not only can I keep going in circles to land on the same place, but there's actually two different kind of fundamental angles that also give me the same sign. So the question is, whenever I take the arc sign of one half, which is what I'm doing to solve this equation, what angle should I get back? It seems like there are an infinity number of angles. There are an infinity number of angles. What angle should the calculator return? And this is where we come back to what we talked about in the beginning, that certain, there's only a certain range of angles that the calculator will return. So I need to walk through why. But in the back of your mind, before we jump into all this uh, stuff that we have to talk about, just remember, when I take the arc sine of anything, I can get an infinite number of angles because all I have to do is figure out the fundamental ones and then I can keep spinning around the unit circle, finding an infinite number of additional angles for any arc sine or any arc cosine, or any arc tangent of any number. I can find tons of angles that all work. So the calculator is not gonna give you an infinite number of answers, so how does it know what to give you? This is what we have decided by convention in math, the way it's gonna work. Let's first talk about only the inverse sine. It's called the inverse sine. It's important for you to know that the sine of an angle always lies between negative one and one, always. How do you know? Because it's a unit circle. The circle only has a radius of one. So if I take the sine of any number around here, it can only give me a, num a maximum up here. The sine up here would be one, positive one. Any angle over here will be just be a fraction of that. Projecting onto this axis, it'll be a fraction of that. The sine over here is zero. The sine over here is also zero. The sine over here is positive one. And the sine down here is negative one. 
any angle down here is going to be projected here. It'll be less than, neg um, well, larger than negative one, basically anywhere between plus one and minus one in that range, larger than negative one and smaller than positive one. It's impossible to get a sign. Go type in any angle you want in your calculator and hit the sign button. You will never get a number larger than one or smaller than negative one. Like you'll never get negative two or negative three or negative four because it, it doesn't work like that the way the projections work, okay? So it's important for you to know that the input, that the sine function can only spit out numbers between plus or minus one. That means that the arc sine, which is the opposite uh, uh, inverse, the opposite function of the sine, can only take as inputs to the bit numbers between negative one to positive one. Why? Because the arc sine is going backwards. I'm feeding numbers in from the outside of the unit circle and I'm getting angles back. So because the sine can only give numbers between plus and minus one, then feeding numbers into the arc sine, remember this picture I drew for you, feeding numbers into the arc sine can only be between plus or minus one because those are the only values that the sine function can give out. Those are the only numbers on the outside of the unit circle. So because of that, the only numbers that can go into this arc sign are actually between plus or minus one. If you go press, let's say five, that's way outside that range and hit arc sign, you'll get an error. It won't do it because it, there is no angle that it has a sign that gives you a five or something because sign can only go between plus or minus one. So the point is the inputs to the arc sign can only be between plus or minus one. But what I'm trying to show here is the sign is a, is a projection on the y-axis. So the numbers between negative one on the y-axis down here and positive one on the y-axis here, any number that I give into this function is only going to be on this part of the y-axis between here and here. So the fundamental angle, the basic angle that is returned from a calculator is gonna be the smallest angles that uh, have that as a sign. And so the smallest angles would be from zero up to pi over two and from zero down to negative pi over two. That is by mathematical definition, those are the only angles that are gonna come back and that's gonna cover all possibilities. Well, there are still other angles around the unit circle that will give you that sign, but what I'm saying is the calculator is only gonna give you the fundamental angle back. We all know that we can spin around the unit circle and get additional angles that have the same sign, but as far as what is that fundamental angle that the calculator will give you back or the computer, or by definition what the function is able to give you back, is always gonna be in this range, because if you think about it, the sign of, let's take some angles here, the sign of pi over two is gonna give you one, and the sine of negative pi over two is gonna give you negative one, and the sine of zero is gonna give you zero. So any angle that I pick in this shaded blue region is going to give me a sine up here at one or a sine at negative one, and the sine only goes from negative one to positive one. So by convention, when I put negative one, positive one in, the calculator, it's not gonna give me an infinity of angles back, it's gonna give me the smallest angle possible that satisfies the thing. So when we go back over here and we said, hey, we're trying to find what angle gives me so the sine is one half. It is true, there's an infinite number of angles, but there's only one fundamental angle, and that's gonna be an angle, this first one. It's going to be between negative pi over two and pi over two. So when you hit the inverse sine, that's the angle you're gonna get back. You're never gonna get five pi over six because five pi over six is over here. One, two, three, four, five pi over six, it's outside the range over here. You're only gonna get that fundamental back, angle back. So that's the sine function. Let's go have a similar discussion for the cosine function. The cosine function is an inverse cosine called arc cosine. It also can only give you values, the cosine function can only give you values between negative one and one for the same exact reason. Any angle I pick is gonna project onto the x axis, which can only go between negative one and positive one. So because of that, the arc cosine, the opposite function, can only take as input values between negative one and positive one, inputs to the arc cosine function. But those negative one to positive one, those are projections on the x-axis. Before, it was projections on the y-axis, but for cosine, it's projections on the x-axis. So those go from negative one all the way to positive one along the x-axis. So these are the inputs to the function. The output angles, then, are going to be the smallest angles that give me that projection. And the smallest angles there is gonna go from zero to pi, right? These down here, these angles aren't gonna ever give you a return of value because, um, well, you see down here, an any angle down here would project to the same axis as this angle projecting down here. So 
you have to have unique angles. I mean, think about it. If you sweep angles through here, what's the, the uh, cosine of zero? It's gonna be a one. What's a cosine of uh, pi? It's gonna give you negative one, right? What's the cosine of pi over two? Zero. So you see, I've already said that the cosine can only go between negative one and one, so all of the angles required to do that are up in the top here because the cosine of any of these angles here are going to go between negative one and positive one. So the, pot, the punchline is you can only feed negative one, positive one in, but the angles that come out are gonna be in the upper half plane up here between zero and pi. It's important for you to realize when you take an arc cosine, hit the button on your calculator, you will always get an angle up here. You'll never ever get an angle down here. Even though those angles down there can still give you the same cosine, we kind of lock the function down into like a base angle return. It's like the base angle that comes back, the most fundamental, the smallest angle that satisfies it will be up here. So, so far, arc sine, always gonna give you angles in the right half plane like this between negative pi over two and pi over two. Arc cosine is always gonna give you angles back between zero and pi, okay. Now the tangent function is the one that's hardest to understand, and I really want you uh, very much to understand it, so I'm going to have to do a little bit more talking. Now what's going on here with the tangent is that the tangent can actually go between negative and positive infinity. Uh, in other words, the, the sine and the cosine, when you take sine and cosine of angles, you always get between, between plus or minus one. However, with tangent, you can get numbers way outside of that, why? Because the tangent is the sine divided by the cosine. It's the sine divided by the cosine. So let's go through a couple of quick examples to remind you of this. What is the tangent of negative pi over two? Negative pi over two. It is the sine of negative pi over two divided by the cosine of negative pi over two, right? So negative pi over two is down here, right? Down here on the unit circle. So what is the sine of that? Well, the projection onto the y-axis is negative one. What is the cosine down here? Way down here, the cosine is zero. Okay, so what do you have? You have negative one over zero. And so what happens is the tangent of this angle is actually negative infinity. And if, as you get away, as you get away from this negative pi over two, like angles really close, what happens is it gets really, really, really big because the denominator is getting really, really close to zero. So go ahead and do it. Go ahead and put a, a, an angle very close to negative pi over two in but not quite there, and you'll see the tangents like, you know, 100 million or something. It's because the top part is approaching negative one and the bottom part is getting closer and closer to zero. So we say at negative pi over two, you actually get negative infinity uh, there for the tangent. Now let's take another example. We took an angle down here. Let's take the angle zero. The tangent of zero radians or zero degrees, whatever, is the sine of zero divided by the cosine of zero. What is the sine of zero? At zero here, there's no projection on y, so the sine of zero is in fact zero, okay? And what is the cosine of zero? The projections on the x-axis, the cosine is one. So because it's zero over one, actually the tangent of zero is zero. Certainly it's not infinity or anything, it's just a number, it's, it's zero, right? Now let's go back to the upper part. So we said this is negative pi over two, this is zero, this is positive pi over two. Let's take a look at what the tangent of positive pi over two is. It's the sine of pi over two divided by the cosine of pi over two. What is the sine of pi over two? Well, up here the sine is positive one, positive one. What is the cosine of pi over two? Well, up here the cosine is zero, no projection onto the x-axis, so you get a zero. Positive over zero give you a positive infinity. So what I'm trying to prove to you through an example is the first time it seems weird, students say, well, how can tangent go to positive and negative infinity, but sine and cosine can't? Sine and cosine are pure projections on the x and y axis of the unit circle. So they can never be bigger or smaller than plus or minus one. But tangent is not a projection. It, well, it is kind of, but it's the division of two projections. So because it's sine over cosine, sometimes the cosine on the bottom can go to zero. And because of that, it can drive the tangent sometimes to negative infinity and sometimes all the way up to positive infinity. So because of that, I've proven to you the tangent function doesn't go between zero, I mean negative one and positive one, it goes between negative infinity, positive infinity. Start typing in angles into your calculator, hit tangent over and over to different angles, you'll see that they go way outside the plus or minus one range. So because of this, uh, 
because tangent can actually give values between negative infinity and positive infinity, what it means is the arc tangent, the opposite operation, can accept as an input value values that are between negative infinity and positive infinity. And those values are going into the function, and then what I'm telling you here is that the angles that come out of the function are also limited to between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, or negative 90 and positive 90. Why are those the special angles? Because remember, the calculator or the computer or whatever is going to give you the smallest range of angles possible to satisfy the input, kind of like the input values possible. So if I put negative infinity in or positive infinity in, what are the range of angles that work? I actually just proved it to you. If we put a negative pi over 2 in for the, for the tangent, we actually get negative infinity. And if we put a 0 in, we get something in the middle, which is 0. And if we put a positive pi over 2 in, we actually get a positive infinity. So these angles here from negative pi over 2 up to positive pi over 2 cover all the possibilities of where tangent can go from negative infinity up to positive infinity. Think about it. Anything from here on up to here, the tangent here is negative infinity. Let me make sure I'm right here. Yeah, the tangent here is negative infinity, the tangent here is zero, and the tangent here is positive infinity. So these angles cover all the possibilities. Any number you can think of sticking into a calculator hitting inverse tangent, these angles will cover it, and they're the smallest angles that will cover that range. So we say the inverse tangent can take as an input any number you want to put in, and they can spit out as an output anything between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Now usually, you see up here I have the equal signs, and I have the equal signs, but for the tangent we don't usually put the equal signs because we don't like to deal with infinities in real life. So we say the inverse tangent, I mean your, your, your calculator is really never going to give you infinity back. I mean infinity is an infinite number, it never stops. So we really say the inverse tangent goes between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2 as its output functions, as its output angles, um, but not exactly including, like it gets incredibly close to negative pi over 2, it drives it up super high basically to infinity, all the way up to positive pi over 2. So let me read my notes and make sure I didn't forget anything. Anytime you take the inverse trig function of a number, the calculator returns a base angle, which is like the smallest angle possible to satisfy uh, the smallest angle possible to satisfy what you gave it as an input. Okay? Other angles exist around the unit circle that have the same sine or cosine or whatever, but the calculator doesn't return all those angles because there's an infinite number of them. It returns the smallest angle possible, which are these ranges I've written on the board here. So sometimes when you're so solving equations, what you'll do is you'll get the base angle back, the fundamental angle, and sometimes you might have to add or subtract 180 degrees or 360 degrees to go into another quadrant depending on what the problem is telling you to do, and we will solve problems like that later. But the fundamental base angle of what your calculator will give you is, is going to be given by these uh, terms here. So what I want to do, I think, this was a really long lesson, but I want to go through it all real quick at lightning speed to make sure we're all on the same page, okay? So we know that the sine of 30 degrees, pi over 6, is 1 half. So we define an inverse going backwards, where the arc sine of the right-hand side gives us an angle back. And so it gives us an angle back, and we can also write it as the inverse sine with the negative 1, but that is not an exponent. Don't treat it like an exponent because it's not, but you might see it in books like this. The arc cosine of a number gives us an angle back, can be written in a similar fashion. So numbers come in, angles come out. Same thing with the arc tangent. Numbers come in, angles come out, and we can write it with the, the minus 1 up there just like before. So graphically, numbers come in, arc inverse sine cosine tangent, arc sine cosine tangent are in here, and angles come out degrees or, or radians. So then we start asking ourselves the question, going back to our fundamental example, sine of an angle is one half. What angle works? So we apply the arc sine to both sides, solve, and we basically want to figure out what the arc sine of one half is. That means what angle exists so that I take the sine of that angle and I get one half. Well, you know it's 30 degrees. You know it's pi over 6, so we put pi over 6 there, which is right here in the unit circle. But then we realize, wait a minute, there's other angles, because this angle also has the sine equal to positive one half. And then we go even further and say, well, wait a minute, not only is the sine of pi over 6 equal to one half, and the sine of 5 pi over 6 also equal to one half, but if we spin around the unit circle to here, then we see the sine of 13 pi over 6 is one half, and if we spin around the unit circle to here, another revolution, we see that 17 pi over 6, the sine of that's one half, even going negative to negative 7 pi over 6, the sign of it, the projection, is always in the same place, 1 half. So what angle does the calculator give you? That's what the rest of the lesson was about. And we said that for 
the sine function. It only gives values back between negative 1 and positive 1, so the inputs to the arcsine can only be from negative 1 to positive 1, which are projections on the y-axis between negative 1 and positive 1. That means the angles, the smallest ones that will work for this projection, are always going to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, just like this. For the arc cosine, it also gives numbers between negative 1 and positive 1, so the inputs to the arc cosine is on the x-axis between negative 1 and positive 1. These are the projections on the x-axis, and the angles, the smallest set of angles that work, are going to be between 0 and pi, which is 0 and 180 degrees. Then we said the tangent's the weird one. It actually can take values as inputs between negative infinity to positive infinity, or I should say the tangent gives values back between negative infinity and positive infinity, so the input to the arctan can be numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity, and we've already described why here. It's because it's the ratio of two trig functions, so sometimes that denominator goes to zero, which drives the tangent to infinity. So if the tangent can go between negative infinity and positive infinity, it turns out that the set of angles that allow that to happen are also between negative pi over 2 up to positive pi over 2. Not inclusive, because we really don't want to get to infinity, but anyway, those are the boundaries there. Why is that? Because the tangent of pi, negative pi over 2 is the sine over the cosine, which is negative infinity. And the tangent of positive pi over 2 is the sine over the cosine, which is positive infinity. So this set of angles from here to here is the smallest set of angles such that the tangent goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. Now that is a ton of talking. It's a lot of talking. And that's why every book I've ever opened, it makes it incredibly hard to understand what they're doing because it's hard to describe in words. But fundamentally, that's what we're going to do. So as we solve problems with the inverse sine or the inverse cosine or the inverse tangent, what we're going to do is try to figure out the angles that make the equation work. We want to solve for the angle because the angle is what comes out. But the angles that come out of an arc sine are only going to be in this range. And the angles that come out of an arc cosine are only going to be in this range. And the angles that come out of an arc tangent are only going to be between this range. And so we're going to have to keep track of that as we solve our problems. And we will be doing that in the future lesson. So make sure you understand this as well as you can. Watch it a couple times if you need to. Follow me on to the next lesson. We're going to crank through a ton of problems involving the inverse trigonometric functions.